Chapter Eleven. The story of how the giant's dance was brought to Britain. Vortigern was dead, but the Saxons whom he had brought to Britain were still rulers of the land. So after burning the castle of Vortigern, Aurelius Ambrosius and Uther Pendragon marched against the Saxons. They defeated them in a great battle, and Hengist was taken prisoner. Then Aurelius Ambrosius called all the British nobles together in council to decide what should be done with Hengist. Aurelius was a very brave man, but he was not cruel. He was noble, and above all things he hated a lie. Hengist was brave too, but he was cruel, revengeful, and deceitful. Aurelius would have spared Hengist's life because he was such a brave man, but Edol, Earl of Gloucester, That noble who fought so well when the Britons were destroyed on Salisbury Plain stood up. It is not right, he said, that Hengist should live. He has brought much sorrow on our land. Through his fault, nearly all our nobles were killed on Salisbury Plain. Let him die. Then all the people shouted, Let him die. So Aurelius bowed his head and said, It is just. Let him die. Edol then led Hengist away and cut off his head. But, although their leader was gone, many Saxons still remained in Britain, and afterwards you will hear how powerful they became. Aurelius was now chosen to be king of Britain, and, like Vortimer, he began to restore order and rebuild the churches and towns which the heathen Saxons had a second time destroyed. The land which the Saxons had stolen he gave back to those of the Britons to whom it really belonged. He revised the laws, and once more peace and justice reigned in the kingdom. When Aurelius had put everything in good order, he went to Salisbury Plain to see the place where so many of his people had been put to death by Hengist and his wicked Saxons. As he stood upon the great plain, he felt very sad. Turning to his nobles who surrounded him, he said, My people died trying to make peace for their country, yet there is no stone to mark the spot. I will have a noble monument raised, so that the wickedness of Hengist and the bravery of my people may be remembered for ever. Then Aurelius sent for all the best builders and masons in the country, and told them to make a splendid monument. But one after another they refused. We are not clever enough to do such a great thing, they said. This made Aurelius sorry, for he wished very much that people should not forget these British heroes. Then a wise man came to him and said, Send for Merlin. If any one can build a great monument, he can. Who is Merlin? asked Aurelius. Merlin is a great magician, replied the wise man. He used to live with Vortigern and do wonderful things for him. Since Vortigern's death, he has been hiding somewhere in Wales. If you can find him, he will build the monument for you. A magician is a person who can do difficult things quite easily. His real home is in fairyland, and he understands fairy language. The fairies come and whisper their wonderful secrets to him, although no one else can see or hear them. Aurelius was very glad to hear about Merlin. He sent messengers into all the land to look for him. They searched about for a long time, until at last they found Merlin, and brought him to the king. As soon as Merlin knew what Aurelius wanted, he said, If you really wish to honor the burying place of these men with a monument which will last for ever, send to Ireland for the giant's dance. What is the giant's dance? asked Aurelius. The giant's dance is a great ring of stones, replied Merlin. They are so wonderful and so old that no one is sure how they came there. But it is said that long, long ago, giants brought these stones from a far off country called Africa. When Aurelius heard that, he burst out laughing. How is it possible, he asked, to remove such big stones from a far off country? Have we not enough stones in Britain with which to build a monument? And he laughed again. Do not laugh. Said Merlin gravely. They are wonderful stones. Every one of them will cure some kind of illness. They are fairy stones. 
When the Britons heard that, they made up their minds to have these stones, and Uther Pendragon was chosen to go with Merlin to bring them. So, taking a great army of men and many ships, they set sail for Ireland. When they arrived in Ireland, they sent a message to the king, asking him to let them take the giant's dance away. It was now the king of Ireland's turn to laugh. "'What mad people these Britons are!' he said. "'Was ever such folly heard of? Have they not enough stones in their own country that they must come to take mine? I shall certainly not give them one single stone of the giant's dance. Tell them to go home again, and not to be so foolish.' But the Britons had quite made up their minds to have the giant's dance. As the king of Ireland would not give it to them, they resolved to fight for it. This they did, and soon put the Irish to flight. Then Merlin led the Britons to the place where the giant's dance stood. Once they saw it, they were filled with joy and wonder, and set to work at once to move the stones. But try how they might, they could not move even the smallest of them one single inch. They pulled and pushed, struggled and strained, till they were hot and tired, but the stones stood as firm as rocks. Merlin sat by, watching them and smiling. Then, when they were all worn out and cross and tired, he rose. "'Now let me try,' he said. "'It is really quite easy.' and in a very short time, with the help of his wonderful magic, he had moved all the stones and put them on board the ships. The people looked on in amazement, and as soon as he had finished, they set sail for Britain with great rejoicing. When they landed, messengers were sent to tell King Aurelius Ambrosius. He gathered all the nobles and clergy, and, wearing his crown and royal robes, rode to Salisbury Plain, there, with great feasting and ceremony, the stones were set up as a memorial to the dead British heroes. They were placed in exactly the same order as they were found in Ireland. Aurelius changed the name from Giant's Dance to Stonehenge, and the great monument may be seen on Salisbury Plain to this day. Most people say this is a fairy tale, and ought not to be put in a history book. They say that the stones on Stonehenge were there long before Merlin lived, long before Hengist and his Saxons, or Caesar and his Romans, even long before Brutus of Troy came. They say that probably no one will ever find out how these stones came to be there, or why they were placed as they are. I dare say they are right, but fairy tales are very interesting, and this fairy tale, if it is one, is to be found in some of the first histories of Britain that were ever written. So certainly at one time people must have believed it to be true. Unfortunately, soon after this a wicked Saxon poisoned the good king, Aurelius Ambrosius. The Britons were very sad at his loss, and they buried him within the giant's dance, where so many other noble Britons lay. Then, because Aurelius had no children, the people chose his brother, Uther Pendragon, to be king. He, too, was good and wise, but he had to spend most of his time fighting against the Saxons. After the death of Hengist, very many Saxons had remained in Britain, and now many more came again in ships from Germany. Fierce and terrible battles were fought, and although the Saxons were often defeated, the Britons could not succeed in driving them away altogether but the name of Uther Pendragon became a terror to these heathen. It is said that when he was so old and feeble that he could not stand, he was carried to battle in a litter. And so great was the power and fame of his courage that the Saxons were utterly defeated. Ah, he said, laughing, these heathen call me the half-dead king, and so indeed I am. Yet victory to me half-dead is better than to be safe and sound and vanquished. For to die with honour is better than to live with disgrace. But, alas, Uther Pendragon, like so many of the good kings before him, was also poisoned by the wicked Saxons. So he died, and the people buried him close to his brother, Aurelius Ambrosius, within the giant's dance on Salisbury Plain. End of chapter 11 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org 
on May 18, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 12 The Coming of Arthur As soon as Uther Pendragon was dead, the mighty nobles of Britain began to quarrel among themselves as to who should be king next. Each noble thought he had the best right, so the quarrelling was dreadful. While they were all gathered together, fighting and shouting at each other, Merlin came among them, leading a tall, fair-haired boy by the hand. When the nobles saw Merlin, they stopped fighting and were silent. They knew how clever he was, and what wonderful things he could do, and they were rather afraid of him. Merlin stood quietly looking at them all from under his bushy eyebrows. He was a very old man, but he was tall and strong and splendid, with a long white beard and fierce glittering eyes. It was no wonder that the Britons felt afraid of him. "'Lords of Britain,' said Merlin at last, "'why fight ye thus? It were more meet that ye prepare to do honour to your king. Uther Pendragon is indeed dead, but Arthur, his son, reigns in his stead.' "'Who is this Arthur? Where is he?' asked the nobles angrily. "'Uther Pendragon had no son.' "'Hear me,' said Merlin. "'Uther Pendragon had a son. It was told to me that he should be the greatest king who should ever reign in Britain. So when he was born, lest any harm should befall him, he was given into my care till the time should come for him to reign. He has dwelt in the land of Avalon, where the wise fairies have kept him from evil, and whispered wisdom in his ear. Here is your king. Honour him. Then Merlin lifted Arthur up and placed him upon his shoulders, so that all the people could see him. There was something so noble and splendid about Arthur, even although he was only a boy, that the great lords felt awed. Yet they would not believe that he was the son of Uther Pendragon. "'Who is this Arthur?' they said again. "'We do not believe what you say. Uther Pendragon had no son.' Then Merlin's bright eyes seemed to flash fire. "'You dare to doubt the word of Merlin?' he shouted. "'O oh, vain and foolish Britons, follow me!' Taking Arthur with him, Merlin turned and strode out of the hall, and all the nobles followed him. As they passed through the streets, the people of the town, and the women and children followed too. On they went, the crowd growing bigger and bigger, till they reached the great door of the cathedral. There Merlin stopped, and the knights and nobles gathered around him, those behind pushing and pressing forward, eager to see what was happening. There was indeed something wonderful to be seen. In front of the doorway was a large stone which had not been there before. Standing upright in the stone was a sword, the hilt of which glittered with gems. Beneath it was written, Whoso can draw me from this stone is the rightful king of Britain. One after another the nobles tried to remove the sword. They pulled and tugged till their muscles cracked. They strained and struggled till they were hot and breathless, for each one was anxious to be king. But it was all in vain. The sword remained firm and fast in the rock. Then last of all Arthur tried. He took the sword by the hilt, and drew it from the stone quite easily. A cry of wonder went through the crowd, and the nobles fell back in astonishment, leaving a clear space round the king. Then as he stood there, holding the magic sword in his hand, the British nobles one after another knelt to Arthur, acknowledging him to be their lord. "'Be thou the king, and we will work thy will. We love thee.' Then the king, in low, deep tones, and simple words of great authority, bound them by so straight vows to his own self, that when they rose, knighted from kneeling, some were pale as at the passing of a ghost, some flushed and others dazed, as one who wakes half-blinded at the coming of a light. Arthur was only fifteen when he was made king, but he was the bravest, wisest, and best king that had ever ruled in Britain. 
as soon as he was crowned he determined to free his kingdom from the Saxons. He swore a solemn oath that he would drive the heathen out of the land. His knights he bound by the same solemn oath. Then, taking the sword which he had won, and which was called Excalibur, and his mighty spear called Ron, he rode forth at the head of his army. Twelve great battles did Arthur fight and win against the Saxons. Always in the foremost of the battle he was to be seen, in his armor of gold and blue, the figure of the virgin upon his shield, a golden dragon and crown upon his helmet. He was so brave that no one could stand against him, yet so careless of danger that many times he would have been killed, had it not been for the magic might of his sword Excalibur, and of his spear Ron. And at last the Saxons were driven from the land. End of chapter 12 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org on May 19, 2006 in Oceanside, California. Chapter 13 The Founding of the Round Table It is said that Arthur not only drove the Saxons out of Britain, but that he conquered many parts of Europe, until at last he ruled over thirty kingdoms. Then, for some years, there was peace. During these years Arthur did much for his people. He taught them to love truth and goodness, and to be Christian and gentle. No king had ever been loved as Arthur was loved. Liberal to each man, I ween, Knight with the best, wondrous keen. To the young he was as father, to the old as comforter. Wondrous stern to the unwise, wrong could he suffer no wise. Right, dear exceeding was to him. Now was Arthur right good king, his folk and all peoples loved him. In those fierce and far-off days, when men spent most of their time fighting, it was very necessary for them to be brave and strong, in order to protect their dear ones, but they were very often cruel as well, and nearly always fierce. Arthur taught people that it was possible to be brave, yet kind, strong, yet gentle. Afterwards people forgot this again, but in the days of Arthur the fame of his court and of his gentle knights spread far and wide. No noble thought himself perfect, unless his armor, and clothes even, were made like those of Arthur's knights. No man thought himself worthy of love until, fighting for the right against the wrong, he had three times conquered an enemy. Many pretty stories are told of Arthur and his gentle courteous knights, although they did not learn all their gentleness and their courtesy at once, as you shall hear. Upon an Easter day Arthur called together all his knights and nobles, from his many kingdoms, to a great feast. They came from far and near, kings, earls, barons, and knights, gay in splendid clothes, glittering with jewels and gold. As they waited for the king, they laughed and talked together, but secretly each heart was full of proud thoughts. Each man thought himself nobler and grander than any of the others. The tables were spread for the feast. They were covered with white silk cloths. Silver baskets piled with loaves, golden bowls and cups full of wine stood ready, and, as the knights and nobles talked and waited, they began to choose where they would sit. In those days master and servants all sat together at the same table for meals. The master and his family sat at the top, and the servants and poor people at the bottom of the table. So it came to be considered that the seats near the top were the best. The further down the table any one sat, the less honor was paid him. At his feast no servants nor poor people were going to sit at table, yet all the nobles wanted places at the top. "'We will not sit in the seats of scullions and beggars,' they said. So they began to push each other aside, and to say, "'Make way, this is my seat.' "'Nay, I am more honorable than you. You must sit below me.' 
"'How dare you? My name is more noble than yours. This is my seat.' "'Give place, I say.' At first it was only words. Soon it came to blows. They had come to the feast unarmed, so they had only their hands with which to fight, but as they grew angrier and angrier they seized the bowls of wine and threw them at each other. Next the loaves of bread and the gold and silver cups were thrown about. The tables and benches were overturned. Howls and yells filled the hall, and everything was in dreadful confusion. When the noise was at its worst, the door opened, and the king appeared. His face was stern and grand as he looked down on the struggling, yelling crowd. "'Sit ye, sit ye down quickly, every man in the place where he is,' he cried. "'Whoso will not, he shall be put to death.' At the sound of their king's stern voice, the foolish nobles were filled with shame. Silently they sat down. The tables and benches were put back in their places, and the feast began. But Arthur was sad at heart. How can I teach my people to be gentle and kind if my knights will not even sit at meat in peace? he said to himself. Then, as he sat sorrowfully wondering what he could do, Merlin came to him. Be not sad, O king, he said, but listen to my advice. Tell your carpenters to make a great round table, at which there shall be a place for every night. Then there can be no more quarrelling, for at a round table there is neither top nor bottom, so no knight can say that he sits above or below another. All shall be equal. Then Arthur was sad no longer. He did as Merlin advised, and had a great round table made, at which there was a seat for each one of his knights. After that there was no more quarrelling as to who should have the best place, for all were equal, and Arthur's knights became known as the Knights of the Round Table. But, alas, the time of peace did not last. Again came days of war and strife. In a great and terrible battle Arthur and nearly all his knights were killed. Once more the fierce heathen swept over the land, filling it with sorrow and bloodshed, and the glory and beauty of knighthood were forgotten in Britain. But some people think that Arthur did not die. They say that when he was wounded so that he could fight no more, the wise fairies came to take him back to fairyland. They say that he is still there, and that some day he will come again. Other people say the stories about Arthur and his knights are not true, but at least we may believe that in those far-off, fierce fighting days, there was a king who taught his people that to be gentle was not cowardly, and that to be cruel was not brave. Who reverenced his conscience as his king, whose glory was redressing human wrong, who spake no slander, no, nor listened to it, who loved one only, and who clave to her. End of chapter 13 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on May 19, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 14 The Story of Gregory and the Pretty Children You remember that the Romans came to Britain, and, in a manner, conquered it. But after staying several hundred years, they again went away. When the Romans came to the island, the people who lived there were Britons. When the Romans left the island, the people who lived there were still Britons. The Romans could not make the Britons Romans, however hard they tried. They could not even make them speak Latin, which was the language of the Romans. The Britons learned many things from the Romans, but in spite of all they learned, they never forgot that they were Britons. When the Saxons came to Britain, things happened very differently. You remember that first of all, Vortigern asked the Saxons to come, and that afterwards every British king fought against them, and tried to drive them away. It seemed sometimes as if the Britons might succeed, but it never seemed so for long. In fact, from the day Hengist and Horsa landed, Britain had never really been free from these fierce heathen people. 
As time went on, they came in greater and greater numbers from over the sea. They were all Saxons, but there were many different tribes of them, some called Jutes, some Angles, and some by other names. The Britons fought nobly for their country, but all in vain. However many of the Saxons were killed did not seem to matter, for their ships always brought more and more of them from over the sea. At last the Saxons had killed nearly all the Britons, and the few who remained took refuge in the mountains, in that part of the country which we now call Wales, and in Cornwall. So to this day the men of Cornwall and the Welsh are the descendants of the ancient Britons, and the language they speak is very like the language spoken by the ancient Britons. I want you to understand that the kings and people of whom you are now going to read are not British, but Saxon, the new people from over the sea, who had gradually taken possession of the whole of the south of Britain. There were other British kings after Arthur, but as nearly all their time was taken up with fighting against the Saxons, the story of their lives is not very interesting. These wild Saxons did not at once settle down quietly into one kingdom. No, they had many leaders, and each leader seized a part of Britain for himself and his followers. So there arose seven different kingdoms. And although they were really all one race of people, and spoke almost the same language, they were always fighting with each other. This lasted until Egbert, one of the kings of one of the seven kingdoms, succeeded in making the others own him as a kind of overlord. He was an Angle, and he changed the name of the country from Britain to Angleland, or England. So we may say that he was the first king of England. The Saxons were heathen, as you know, and they pulled down the churches and killed the Christian priests. So all the land became heathen again. Only in the wild mountains of Wales the teaching of Arthur and his Christian knights was remembered. But once again the story of Christ was brought to Britain, and you shall now hear how it happened. In those days slavery was allowed, that is, people used to buy and sell men and women, and little boys and girls, just as if they were cattle. The merchants who came to trade with Britain used to take away slaves to sell in far-off countries. One day a good man called Gregory was walking through the market-place in Rome. It was market-day, and the square was crowded with people buying and selling. It was very noisy and gay. Fine gentlemen strolled about, Careful housewives went from stall to stall trying to find what was cheapest and best. Friends met and chatted, and through all the noise and bustle Gregory walked with his head bent, deep in thought. Suddenly he stood still. He had been awakened from his dream by the sound of children's voices, and now he stopped to watch them, as they laughed and played together. These children had fair faces and rosy cheeks, their eyes were merry and blue, and their hair shone like gold in the sunshine. Gregory thought they were the prettiest children that he had ever seen. A very tender look came into Gregory's eyes as he stood and watched them playing. Then he sighed, for he saw by the chains round their necks that they were to be sold as slaves. "'Poor children,' he said, "'so far from home.' He knew they must come from some far-off country, because all the people in his own land had dark faces and black hair. "'Where do these children come from?' he asked, turning to the man who had charge of them. "'From the island called Britain,' replied the man. "'But the people are called Angles.' "'Angles,' said Gregory, as he gently put his hand on their curly heads. "'Nay, not Angles.' but angels they should be called. The children could not understand what Gregory said, but they knew from his voice that it was something kind. They ceased their play and stood round him, looking up trustingly into his face with their big blue eyes. Gregory stroked their curly heads, and as he bent over them he felt love for the pretty fair-haired children grow in his heart. He asked many questions about them, and when he heard that they were heathen, he made up his mind to buy them, and teach them to be Christians. 
Gregory took the pretty children home with him. He was very kind to them, and taught them how to grow up into good men and women. They loved him, you may be sure, and he loved them so much that he made up his mind to go to Britain, to teach all their brothers and sisters there to be Christians too. But the people of his own land were so fond of Gregory that they would not let him go, so although it was a great sorrow to him, he was obliged to give up his plan. But Gregory did not forget about it. Some years after this he was made Bishop of Rome, and so became a very powerful and important person. And one of the first things he did after he became powerful was to send a good man called Augustine to preach about Christ to the Angles. Augustine took about forty other good men with him, and set out for Britain. We are not told if the pretty children, whom Gregory had bought in the Roman market-place so many years before, were among these men, but I think very likely they were. They would be so glad to go back to their own country to teach their brothers and sisters all the good things they had learned from Gregory. It is a long way from Italy to England, and in those days when there were no trains and travelling was both difficult and dangerous, it seemed very long indeed. But after many adventures Augustine and his men arrived safely on the seashore of France. There they had to wait for a ship to take them across to Britain, or England, as we must now call it. While they waited, Augustine and his men heard such stories about the fierceness of the Angles and the Saxons that they were frightened. They were so frightened that they turned back to Rome. When Gregory heard that they had returned, he was very angry. "'I am ashamed that you should be so cowardly,' he said to Augustine. "'Go back again. If the people of England kill you, you die for others, even as Christ did.' So Augustine set out again. This time he reached England. Although the Saxons were fierce and lawless, they treated Augustine and his followers very kindly. Ethelbert, who was King of Kent, one of the seven kingdoms into which England was divided, was the first to listen to them. He was a heathen, but he had married a Christian lady, and so had already heard something of the story of Christ. Soon he and all his people were baptized. Augustine does not seem to have had any difficulty in persuading the Saxons to leave off worshipping idols. One would think that the heathen priests at least would have been very angry, and that they would have tried to stop the teaching of this new religion. But they did not. A story is told of a priest whose name was Coifi. He sat one day among the people listening very attentively to the story of God and Christ. When the preacher had finished speaking there was a great silence. This new religion seemed to the people to be very beautiful, but they were so accustomed to believing that their idols had power to punish them, if they neglected them or disobeyed them, that they were afraid. Then Coifi rose. "'No one,' he said, "'has ever served the old gods more faithfully than I have. I have tried to believe in them all my life, yet they have never done anything to make me better or happier.' This new teaching seems to me to be good. Let us destroy our old gods, and turn to the teaching of Christ. Then, while the astonished people looked on in fear, Coifi took a spear in his hand, mounted upon a horse, and, riding at full speed, knocked over the great idol which for so many years he had worshipped as God. When the people saw their god fallen and broken, they trembled. They felt sure something dreadful would happen to Coifi for his wickedness but nothing happened. So, taking heart and following the example of Coifi, the people set fire to their temple, which was soon burned to the ground, and the idols with it. Then all the people were baptized, and became Christians. In time, Augustine or his followers went through all the seven kingdoms of England. It took a long time, but at last the whole land became Christian, although of course the people did not learn all at once, to live as good Christians ought. End of chapter 14 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On May 20th, 2006 In Oceanside, California
Chapter Fifteen. How King Alfred Learned to Read. When the Saxons first came to England, they came only to fight and kill. But soon they began to love their new home, and when two or three hundred years had passed, they forgot that they had ever lived in any other country. So instead of fighting against England, they began to fight for and love the land as their own. Then English kings arose who tried to make good laws and rule the people well, as some of the British kings had done. But just as the Romans had come to conquer Britain, and as the Saxons themselves had come, so now another people came. These new enemies were the Northmen, or Danes. They came from the countries which we now call Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. These Danes, as we shall call them, were fierce wild men. They loved to sail upon the sea, they loved to fight. They were heathen, too, just as the Saxons had been when they first came to England. Many and long were the battles which were fought between the English and the Danes, but year by year the Danes grew stronger, and the English weaker, till it seemed as if the land was going to be conquered once again. But at last a great English king, called Alfred, began to rule. He beat the Danes in many battles, and nearly drove them out of the country. Alfred was the youngest son of Ethelwulf, who was king of Wessex. One of the seven kingdoms into which England was divided. He was also the grandson of Egbert, that king who changed the name of Britain to England. Although Ethelwulf was really king only of Wessex, he was overlord over all the rulers of the other seven kingdoms of England. So you must remember, when we speak of the king of England at this time, that we do not mean that he was the only king in the land. But Wessex was the chief of the seven kingdoms, and the king of Wessex was the chief of the seven kings. In the end, the king of Wessex became real king of all England, while the other kingdoms disappeared and their kings were forgotten. King Ethelwulf's wife was called Osburga. She was a good and wise woman, and a very kind mother to her little children. She was clever, too, and fond of reading. Which was rather uncommon in those days when very few people could read or cared about it. In the time of the Romans, you remember, books were written on strips of parchment and rolled up like maps. Now they were shaped and bound just like our books, only as there was no paper and no printing, they were still written on parchment, and the pictures were all painted by hand. It took a long time to make a book and required a great deal of money to buy one. One day, when Alfred, the youngest son of King Ethelwulf, was quite a tiny boy, he was playing with his big brothers, while Osburga, his mother, sat watching them and reading. The book she read was one of old English songs. Osburga was very fond of these songs, and used to say them to her little boys when they were tired of play. It was a pretty book, full of pictures and bright letters in gold and blue and red. As Osburga turned the pages, Alfred saw the pretty pictures, so he left his play and came to lean against his mother's knee to look at them. What a pretty book it is, mother, he said. Do you like it, little one? said Osburga. Yes, mother, I do, replied Alfred. Then all the other boys came crowding round their mother to see the pretty book, too. They pressed against her. And leaned over her shoulder till nothing was to be seen but five curly heads close together. Oh, isn't it lovely? they said, as Osburga slowly turned the pages, explaining the pictures, and letting them look at the beautiful colored letters at the beginnings of the songs. When Osburga saw how they all liked the book, she was very much pleased. She pushed them all away from her a little, and looked round their happy, eager faces. You see, in those days, even kings' sons had no picture books, such as every child has now, and it was quite a treat for these princes to be allowed to look at this beautiful one. Do you truly like this book? asked Osburga. Oh, yes, mother, we do, they all answered at once. Then, boys, she said, I will give it to the one who first learns to read it. Oh, mother, do you mean it? May I try too? Asked Alfred. Yes, I do mean it, and of course you may try, 
answered Osburga, smiling at him. And perhaps she hoped that he would win the prize, for both his father and his mother loved Alfred best of all their children. And Alfred did win the prize. He was so eager to have the book that he worked hard all day long, and one morning, while his big brothers were still trying to read the book, he came to his mother and read it without making any mistakes. Then Osburga kissed him and gave him the prize as she had promised. All his life afterwards, Alfred was fond of books, and even when he became king and had many, many other things to do, he still found time not only to read, but to write them. End of chapter 15. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. On May 20th, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 16. King Alfred in the Cowherd's Cottage. When Ethelwolf, Alfred's father, died, each of his sons became king in turn. During these reigns the Danes became more and more troublesome. Nearly all the time was spent in fighting, so that the country came to be in a very sad state indeed. When Ethelred, who was the last of Ethelwolf's sons except Alfred, came to the throne, Alfred had grown to be a man and although he was still very young, he helped his brother a great deal. And when Ethelred died, the people chose Alfred to be their king. For although Ethelred had two sons, they were little boys, and no one thought of making either of them king. The people knew that a strong and wise man was needed to rule in England, and Alfred was both strong and wise. No king has ever had to fight more bravely for his kingdom than Alfred had. When he came to the throne, the Danes were growing more and more bold. They did not now only come in their ships to plunder and rob, and then sail away again. They came now to live in the land, killing the people, and then taking their houses for themselves. So all the first years of Alfred's reign were spent in fighting these fierce enemies— but Alfred did not only fight bravely, he thought too. The Danes were brave and daring sailors, just as the English had been before they came to live in England. But somehow, after the English settled down, they seemed to have forgotten about how to build ships, and how to sail upon the sea. But Alfred was wise, and saw how much better it would be to stop the Danes before they landed at all. So he built ships, and went in them to fight the Danes on the sea. In the year 875 A.D., King Alfred and his ships met the Danes and their ships, and fought a great battle, and won a great victory. That was the first of many, many sea victories, which the English have won, and ever since the days of Alfred, England has had a navy, and Britannia has ruled the waves. Ye mariners of England, that guard our native seas, whose flag had braved a thousand years, the battle and the breeze, your glorious standard launch again to match another foe, and sweep through the deep while the stormy winds do blow. While the battle rages loud and long, and the stormy winds do blow, Britannia needs no bulwarks, no towers along the steep, her march is on the mountain waves, her home is on the deep. With thunders from her native oak she quells the floods below, as they roar on the shore, when the stormy winds do blow. When the battle rages loud and long, and the stormy winds do blow. But even although Alfred gained this battle at sea, the Danes were not beaten altogether. Again and again Alfred had to fight, but at last he forced the Danes to make peace. They swore by a most solemn and dreadful oath that they would go away and never make war against the English again. This vow was taken with great ceremony. Sheep and cattle were killed and offered in sacrifice to the heathen gods, for the Danes, you remember, were heathen. A beautiful ring of gold, called the Holy Bracelet, was dipped in the blood of the animals. This bracelet was then placed upon an altar, 
and, laying their hands upon it, the Danish chiefs swore to fight no more against the English. This was not the first time that the Danes had promised to go away and fight no more, but they had always broken their promises. Now Alfred thought they would be sure to keep their word, because of the very solemn vow they had taken. But the Danes did not mean to keep this promise any more than the others. Very soon they came back again as bold as before, or bolder. Once more fierce battles raged, till at last, weary of fighting, and forsaken by nearly all his followers, Alfred was forced to hide for a time in the marshes of Somerset. This was the saddest part of Alfred's life. He was a king, yet he had neither crown nor royal robes, neither palace nor servants. He was so poor that he went to live in the cottage of a cowherd called Denewulf. His clothes were so old and worn that the cowherd's wife thought that he was a friend of her husband, and so she treated him as if he had been a common man, and not a great king. One day Denewulf's wife was very busy. She had been baking cakes, and had still many things to do. Alfred, meanwhile, was sitting by the fire. He had been mending his bow and arrows, but they had dropped from his hand, for, thinking deeply about his kingdom and his people, and of how he could free them from the Danes, he had forgotten all else. It seemed to Denewulf's wife that Alfred was a lazy sort of fellow. She did not know the great matters he had to think of, and she wondered how any one could sit for hours by the fire doing nothing, while she and her husband had to work so hard. Now, she said to herself, this lazy fellow can at least look after my cakes, while I go to do something else. Here, good man, she said to him, just mind my cakes for me, and don't let them burn. When they are nice and brown on one side, turn them over on to the other side, like this and she showed him how to do it. "'All right, good wife, I will look after your cakes for you,' replied Alfred. But when the good woman had gone, Alfred sank once more deep in thought. As he watched the cakes, he looked into the fire. Soon, in the red glow of the burning ashes, he saw wonderful things. The cakes and the cowherd's cottage vanished. Once again he was leading his army— his banner with its golden dragons fluttered in the breeze, his spear was in his hand, his crown upon his head. He heard the shout of his soldiers as they charged the Danes. The ranks of the enemy broke, they fled, to their ships they fled. Fast behind them came the English, they set fire to the Danish ships. He smelt the smoke as it rolled upward, heard the crackle of the flames, the shrieks of the dying, the shouts of victory. England was saved. Then suddenly he was awakened out of his dream by a blow to his shoulder, and an angry voice in his ear. "'Canst thee not mind the cakes, man? And doesn't thee see them burn? I's bound thee'll eat them fast enough, as soon as tis thy turn.' Alas, the cakes, and not the Danish ships, were burning. Alfred was a great king, but he had proved a poor cook— and the good wife was very angry. She scolded him well, little thinking that she was scolding her king. She was still rating when Denewulf came in. "'Hush thee, woman, hush thee,' he said, ashamed and frightened. "'Hush, shall I?' she cried angrily. "'The lazy loon, the idle good-for-naught, to sit by the fire and see the cakes burn, and never stir a finger.' "'Hush thee, woman!' said Denewulf again, in despair. "'It is the king!' "'The king!' cried the good wife, astonished, and a little frightened, too. "'Well, king or no king,' she added grumblingly after a minute, "'he ought to have minded the cakes.' Alfred was not angry, as Denewulf feared he would be, and afterwards, when he came to his kingdom again, Alfred made the cowherd a bishop— for he had found out while hiding in his cottage that Denewulf was a good and wise man. So his wife became a great lady, and perhaps never baked any more cakes. Certainly she never again had a king to watch them for her. 
End of chapter 16. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. On May 22, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 17. More about Alfred the Great. Soon Alfred was joined in his hiding-place in Somerset by his wife and children and a few of his nobles. They chose a hill which rose above the surrounding marshes for their camp, and there Alfred and his nobles worked like common men, building a strong fort. Because of this the place was called Athelney, which means the Isle of Nobles. While Alfred worked on the Isle of Nobles, he sent messengers secretly among his people, telling them where he was. Soon a small but faithful band gathered round him. Then, one day, some of Alfred's friends suddenly attacked the Danes, won a victory, and seized the great Danish banner called the Raven. The Danes were very sad at the loss of this banner, for they believed it to be a magic one. They said that when they were going to win a battle, the raven would spread its wings as if to fly, but when they were going to lose, the raven drooped its wings in sorrow. Now that their precious banner had been taken, they were always afraid of losing. This victory cheered the English very much, and when the people heard of it, more and more of them gathered round their king. Alfred now began to feel that the time for striking a blow had come, but first he wanted to find out exactly how many Danes there were, and what plans they had. So he dressed himself like a minstrel or singer, and taking his harp he went to the Danish camp. There he began to play upon his harp, and to sing the songs he had learned when he was a boy. The Danes were a fierce, wild people, yet they loved music and poetry. They were delighted with Alfred's songs, and he was allowed to wander through the camp wherever he liked. Alfred stayed in the Danish camp for several days, singing his songs and playing sweet music, and all the time watching and listening. He found out how many Danes there were, and where the camp was strong and where it was weak. He listened to the king as he talked to his captains, and, when he had found out everything he could, he slipped quietly away, and went back to the Isle of Nobles. The Danes were sorry when they found that the gentle minstrel had gone, and little did they think that it was the great and brave King Alfred who had been singing and playing to them. Alfred now knew that his army was strong enough to fight the Danes, so he left his fort on the Isle of Nobles and boldly marched against them. A battle was fought in which the Danes were defeated, and from that time onwards Alfred was victorious. The dark days were over, the power of the Danes was crushed. Their king, Guthorm, submitted to Alfred, and even became a Christian. When he was baptized, Alfred stood as godfather to him, and changed his name from Guthorm to the English name of Æthelstan. Then Alfred made a peace with the Danes, called the Peace of Wedmore. And although the Danes did not leave England, they did not fight any more, and they left Wessex and kept within the land which was given to them in the north. Afterwards this part was called the Danela, or Daneland. And now it was, in the time of peace, that Alfred began to do great things for his people, the things by which he earned his name of Alfred the Great. He collected the laws and wrote them out so that people could understand them. He did away with the laws which he thought were bad, and made others. One law he made was that a man who had done wrong could not be punished unless twelve men agreed that he really had been wicked and ought to be punished. This was called trial by jury, and means trial by those who have promised to do justly. Our word jury comes from a Latin word, which means to promise or swear. It was a very good law, for sometimes if a man hated another man he would say he had done something wicked in order to have him punished. But when twelve men had to agree about it, it was not easy to have an innocent person unjustly punished. 
Alfred was much loved. He made good laws, and the people kept them. They kept them so well that it is said that golden chains and bracelets might be hung upon the hedges, and no one would touch them. King Alfred was fond of reading and learning, and he tried to make his people fond of learning too. In those days the monasteries were the chief places to which people went to learn. But the Danes had destroyed nearly all the monasteries, so Alfred began to build them again, and he also founded schools. Then, as nearly all the books which were worth reading were written in Latin, he translated into English several of the best he had read. He did this because he saw how much more difficult it was for people to learn to read when they had to do so in a foreign language. Alfred built more great ships and sent people into far countries to bring back news of them to England. He encouraged the English to make all kinds of things in order to trade with these far off countries. In fact, during all his life, Alfred was thinking only of his people and of what was best for them. You will wonder how he found time to do all these things, and indeed it is wonderful, especially in those days when there were no clocks to strike the hours and remind people how time was flying. Yet Alfred divided the day into three parts eight hours for work, eight hours for study, and eight hours for rest. He invented a kind of clock for himself. He had great candles made, which were marked off into parts, each part burning for an hour. A man watched the candle, and, when the flame burned down to the mark, he went to the king and said, O king, another hour has fled. Alfred was good and wise and kind. There never was a better king in England. He had to fight many battles, and war is terrible and cruel. But he did not fight for love of conquering, as other kings did. He fought only to save his country and his people. We never hear of him doing one unjust or unkind act. He was truthful and fearless in everything. It is no wonder, then, that we call him Alfred the Great, Alfred the Truth Teller, England's Darling. End of chapter 17 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on May 22, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 18 Ethelred the Unready Alfred died in 901 AD. And his son Edward became king after him. He is called Edward the Elder because he was the first of a great many kings of that name. He was a good king and was greatly helped by his sister, Ethelfleda, who was called the Lady of Mercia. She was a brave, wise woman and, like Boudica, often led her soldiers in battle. For the Danes began to be troublesome again. And Edward and Ethelfleda had to fight many battles with them. When Edward the Elder and Ethelfleda both died, Edward's son, Athelstane, came to the throne. He too was a good king, and he too had to fight with the Danes. After him came six kings who have been called the boy kings, because they were all so young when they came to the throne. Some of these boy kings were wise and good, and all of them had to fight with the Danes. Year by year the Danes were becoming more and more powerful in England. They not only came and went in their ships, but many more of them settled in the country. They made their homes in England and forgot about their old homes in Denmark. That would not have mattered much if they had become good English subjects, willing to obey an English king, but that is what they did not do. Instead, they rebelled always against the king, and so wars and fighting went on. Now you shall hear about the last of the boy kings. His name was Ethelred, and because he was foolish and slow, he was also called the Unready. He lived about a hundred years after Alfred. In his reign, everything seemed to go wrong. The Danes soon found out what a foolish man he was, and they came in greater numbers than ever. Ethelred had not spirit enough to be a good leader. He was never sure of what he wanted to do. 
so his soldiers lost heart, and his captains quarrelled among themselves. He built ships, but they were shattered by storms. The city of London caught fire by accident and was burnt to the ground. Everywhere there was misery and misfortune. Then Ethelred thought of an unhappy plan for ridding the country of the Danes. He said to them, I will give you a large sum of money if you will go away. The Danes, of course, were delighted at the idea of getting money so easily, and they gladly promised. Ethelred gave them the gold, and they sailed away, and the English people rejoiced. But the Danes, as you know, were never careful about keeping their promises. They went home, it is true, but when they had spent all the money which Ethelred had given them, they said, Let us go to England again and rob the people. Perhaps their foolish king will give us more money. And so they sailed to England. Ethelred again gave them money to go back to Denmark. Again they sailed away, but when the money was spent, once more they returned. Over and over again the same thing happened, Ethelred always giving the Danes larger and larger sums, for they grew more and more greedy when they saw how easy it was to make the foolish English king give them money. How did Ethelred get all the money which he gave to the Danes? Was it his own? No. In order to get the money, Ethelred taxed the people. That is, he made each person pay a certain sum every year, and this was called Danegelt, or Dane money. The English were already accustomed to pay taxes for various things, and at first they did not mind paying this new one. Indeed, they were glad to do it, in the hope of getting rid of their terrible enemies. But when the Danes returned time after time, when year by year the tax grew heavier and heavier, the people grew wary of it, and angry. "'We strive and toil,' they said, "'to earn money, that we may live in peace and comfort, but it is of no use. The king takes our money and gives it to these idle heathen. We will work and pay no more.' So the people grew moody, and the country was in greater misery than before. Then Ethelred thought of another plan by which to get rid of the Danes. This plan was both terrible and wicked. He sent messengers into every part of England, telling the English that, on the 13th of November, they were to kill all the Danes, men, women, and children. This was a most cruel and wicked order. Besides, it was not the Danes who were living in England who gave the greatest trouble, but those who year by year came across the sea in their ships, to plunder and kill. But Ethelred was weak and cowardly. He dared not fight the fierce sea-kings, as they were called, so he thought he would murder their peaceful brothers and sisters. And the most dreadful thing is that Englishmen all over the country were found willing to carry out the cruel order. Yet we must not think too hardly of these old Englishmen, for they had suffered so much from the Danes that it was little wonder that they hated them. Even those Danes who were living peaceably in England were so proud and haughty that the English hated them. They always thought they should have the best of everything. They expected to be called Lord Dane. They treated the English like slaves, and if an Englishman and a Dane met in a narrow passage or on a bridge, the Englishman had to go back until my Lord Dane had passed. So when the 13th of November came, the Englishman rose and slaughtered the Danes, every one, man, woman, and child, rich and poor, high and low. None were saved. Among those who were killed was the Princess Gunhilda, sister of the King of Denmark. She had married an English lord, and was living with him in England. She was not only very beautiful, but good. The Danes were heathen, but Gunhilda had become Christian, and in her gentle way she tried to bring about peace between the English and the Danes. When the terrible slaughter began, and the air was filled with shrieks, Gunhilda's husband, son, and servants gathered round her to protect her. Bravely they fought for her, but all in vain— First her husband, and then her son, fell dead at her feet, pierced by many spears. 
Then a cruel man seized the beautiful Gunhilda by the hair, and buried his sword in her heart. Alas! she said, as she sank dying to the ground, my death will bring great sorrow upon England. End of chapter 18 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On May 22, 2006 In Oceanside, California Chapter 19 How Edmund Ironside Fought for the Crown Gunhilda was right. This act of Ethelred's proved to be not only wicked but foolish, and it brought great sorrow upon England. For as soon as Swain, king of Denmark, heard of the cruel murder, he determined to avenge his sister's death. Gathering a great company of soldiers and a most wonderful fleet of ships, he set sail for England. Over the blue waves came the fierce sea-kings in their splendid ships, with purple sails and glittering golden prows. Beasts and birds, dragons and serpents were carved upon the painted and gilded ships, and it seemed as if all the monsters of fairyland were gathered to terrify and conquer the people of England. No storm stayed the ships. Soft winds blew gently over sunny sparkling waters, as nearer and nearer they came. Never before had the Danes come in such splendour and such force. The frightened people fled as these fierce sea-warriors landed, and where they landed, and on through all the country, wherever they passed, they left behind them a track of death and desolation. The people were killed, the towns were burned, the crops and cattle trampled and destroyed. Hunger, misery, and tears filled the land. Ethelred, weak and cowardly as ever, deserting his country in the hour of need, fled to France with his wife and children. Ethelred fled to France because his wife, Emma, was the daughter of the Duke of Normandy. Normandy is part of France. Queen Emma's father received them kindly, and no doubt Ethelred enjoyed himself very much at the Norman court, riding and hunting, and quite forgetting his poor country. So Swain, king of Denmark, was master of England. But though he was proclaimed king, he never wore the crown, for he died suddenly, leaving the throne to his son, Canute. But Englishmen could not forget the great Alfred and his good sons. They longed to have a king of their own people again. So, when Swain died, they sent messengers to France, begging Ethelred to come back, and promising to be true to him, and to fight for him, if only he would rule a little better than he had done. Ethelred came back, and, had he had a little courage, he might soon have won all England again, for his people were ready and willing to die for their country. They only waited for a brave man to lead them. But Ethelred was neither better nor wiser than before. Soon his soldiers lost heart again, and some of them even deserted, and went to fight for Canute the Dane. This, too, in spite of all that Edmund Ironside, the brave son of Ethelred, could do. Edmund was called Ironside because of his strength and courage. He tried to keep the army together, but he could not hide his father's cowardice and weakness from the soldiers. Soon, however, Ethelred died, and the people immediately crowned Edmund king. But some of the wise men and nobles thought it was of no use to try to fight against the Danes any longer, so they crowned Canute king. Thus there were two kings of England, an English king and a Danish, and the wars between the two nations continued as fiercely as ever. But now the English had a wise king and a brave leader. That was all they asked. They took heart again, and joyfully followed him. Five great battles were fought, and in nearly all of them the English were victorious. That seems to show that it was truly Ethelred's fault that the English were ever beaten. He did not love his people, and he did not care what happened to them. 
he thought only of his own pleasure and comfort. But Edmund Ironside was different. He thought only of his country, and although he was winning battle after battle, it made him sad and sick at heart to see his people die. The horror of war had filled the land for so many years that he longed for peace. One day, as the two armies lay opposite each other, ready for battle, Edmund sat in his tent, sad and weary. The summer sun shone on unplowed fields and ruined homes. All around there was sorrow and desolation. As Edmund looked across the land with sad eyes, he thought to himself that he would gladly die if he could bring peace to his dear country. He sat some time in thought. And then suddenly calling one of his captains, he said to him, Go to Canute, the Dane. Say to him that I, Edmund Ironside, King of England, send him greeting. That, weary of battle and death, I challenge him to fight in single combat with me alone. He who dies shall die and be buried as befits a king. He who lives shall be ruler over all England. The captain bowed low before the king, and mounting upon his horse, he rode off to the Danish camp with this strange message. When Canute heard it, he sat silently thinking for some time. Then, turning to the messenger, he said, Go, tell Edmund Ironside that I will meet him, and, please God, although I am the lesser man, I shall conquer him and still be king of England. Both kings then arrayed themselves in splendid armor, with shield and sword and spear, and rode out to fight. The two armies stood around watching in hope and fear. At first the kings fought with their spears while riding upon their horses, then leaping to the ground they attacked each other fiercely with their swords. Both were strong, but Edmund was the taller, and Canute soon began to feel that he was being beaten. So, in a loud voice, he cried out, Why should we fight thus? Two kings as we should be brothers, not enemies. Let us stop fighting, and divide the kingdom, and be at peace. Then King Edmund, throwing down his sword, held out his hands to Canute. Brother, he said, we will be kings together. So, once more, England was divided. Edmund Ironside, the Englishman, ruled over the south part, and Canute the Dane ruled over the north part, and there was peace in the land. But this did not last very long, for very soon Edmund died. Altogether he had only reigned seven months, and much of that time had been spent in fighting, yet he had done more for his people than Ethelred had done in many years. End of chapter 19 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on May 22, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 20 Canute and the Waves When Edmund Ironside died, Canute became king over all England as it had been agreed between them that whoever lived the longest should have the whole kingdom. Edmund had two sons, and Canute was afraid that the people might wish to make one of them king, so he sent both to a far-off country called Hungary. Perhaps it was wrong to banish these children, but at least it was better than killing them, as some people say he wanted to do. Canute did not begin by being a good king. At first he was bad and cruel, but he ended by being very good and wise. In fact, he seems to have ruled so well that the English came to love him almost as if he had been an English king. They loved him, but they flattered him too. He was certainly a great king, for he ruled not only over England, but over Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. The nobles thought it pleased Canute to be told of his greatness, so they used often to let him hear them praise him. One day, as they were walking upon the seashore, the nobles began, as usual, to tell Canute how powerful he was. "'All England obeys you,' they said. 
and not only England, but Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Should you desire it, you need but command all the nations of the world, and they will kneel before you as their king and lord. You are king on sea and land, even the waves obey you. Now this was foolish talk, and Canute, who was a wise man, did not like it. He thought he would teach these silly nobles a lesson, so he ordered his servants to bring a chair. When they had brought it, he made them set it on the shore, close to the waves. The servants did as they were told, and Canute sat down, while the nobles stood around him. Then Canute spoke to the waves. "'Go back,' he said. "'I am your lord and master, and I command you not to flow over my land. Go back, and do not dare to wet my feet.' But the sea, of course, neither heard nor obeyed him. The tide was coming in, and the waves rolled nearer and nearer, until the king's feet and robe were wet. Then Canute rose, and, turning sternly to his nobles, said, "'Do you still tell me that I have power over the waves? O oh, foolish men, do you not know that to God alone belongs such power? He alone rules earth and sky and sea, and we and they alike are his subjects, and must obey him. The nobles felt how foolish they had been, and did not again try to flatter Canute in such a silly way. From that day, too, Canute never wore his crown, but placed it upon the figure of Christ in the minster at Winchester, as a proof of his humility. From this story we learn that Canute was a Christian, although many of the Danes were still heathen, but no doubt they very soon followed the example of their king, and became Christians too. Gradually the differences between the Danes and the English passed away. The Danes began to forget that they had ever lived in any other country, and lived like Englishmen, taking English ways and customs for their own. So once more England became a united kingdom. But this, of course, did not happen all at once. It was many years before the English and the Danes quite forgot their quarrels. As Canute had other countries to govern as well as England, he felt the need of someone to help him rule, so he divided England into four earldoms, and placed an earl over each part. These earls ruled the kingdom under the king. Over the part which was called Wessex, Canute placed a man named Godwin, who afterwards became of very great importance in English history. In the year 1035 A.D., King Canute died, and was buried in the minster at Winchester. After him his two sons, Harold Harefoot and Hardicanute, reigned. Neither of them was good, and, at the death of Hardicanute, the English were easily persuaded by Earl Godwin not to have any more Danish rulers. Following his advice they chose Edward, the son of Ethelred the Unready, to be their king. End of chapter 20 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On May 22, 2006 In Oceanside, California